Hey everyone, my name is Matt. Welcome to my shop and welcome back to my series on moving and setting up my new woodworking shop. If you missed any of the other videos, I will leave you a link to a playlist that contains all the videos that go along with this series so you can easily and quickly check those out. This time we're going to cover the electrical setup and then a little bit about the heating that I have here in the shop. So first on the electrical side of things, hopefully I'll give you some ideas of things to think about and consider as you were setting up your own shop. Uh, this being my second shop, I've learned quite a lot having my last shop for 10 years and starting that from the ground up, so to speak as well. So I have some things I've done in here electrically to make, uh, it just makes more sense for what I'm doing. So uh, let's, uh, let's get into it. And the big theme with this whole discussion is going to be future proofing. <laughs> and unless you have all the tools and equipment that you're ever going to have already, you're really going to be looking down the road in the future a little bit to see what am I anticipating of adding to my shop so I can make sure that I'm set up at this stage to make that transition in the future as easy as possible. And the first big thing that is going to be the big future proofing thing is going to be one of these, a sub panel. So what the sub panel is going to allow you to do is to have all of your circuits for your shop coming out of this one point instead of running all of your circuits all the way back to your main breaker everything comes back here so instead of a bunch of smaller wires a bunch of them all going back to the main panel you have a big wire that comes to here and then you can feed everything right from this panel so if you need to add anything it's all right here another advantage of that is you can add a lot more circuits to your system so if your main panel is already pretty full this will give you a whole lot more room for additional circuits. Now how big of a panel you need is going to be the first thing to consider as you are thinking about the future. So in my old shop I had a 60 amp sub panel and this shop this is a 90 amp sub panel. So you need to think about what are the things you're going to be doing all at once that's going to be drawing electricity all together. And for most of us in our shops it's going to be lighting, running the dust collector, and then whatever your biggest tool is you're going to use with your dust collector. So in my old shop I went with a 60 amp panel because at the time when I had it installed I had a 110 volt uh, dust collector so that was like what 15 or 20 amps and then the biggest tool I had at the time was my jointer which was a another 15 amps or so. So plus the lighting would be 35 amps would be my total draw as a one person shop. So a 60 amp panel was you know, future proof in a sense that I could grow into that more larger power demand. I went to a bigger panel here because I now have my sawmill and welder outlet coming off of this panel. At the old shop, I had a separate line all the way back to the main panel for that outlet, and then I had a separate thing for the sub panel. So those two things were separate. Now they're together in here, so I have the ability to have that thing coming off of this panel. Now in both shops, I was a little bit spoiled because the shop butted up against the room in the house that contained the main panel for the house. So installing a sub panel was a very easy process. There wasn't a whole lot of like fishing wire things because it's literally on the other side of this wall. So if you think about the installation process as opposed to running a bunch of small stuff back to the main panel, if you have a longer run, it's going to be much better in the long run to just run the sub panel and be done with it and not to worry about pulling a bunch of wires all the time. The wire itself, the startup cost is going to be more because you're going to be dealing with a more expensive, larger wire just to get power to here. But the time to pull that thing through, like if you have to go through an attic or a crawl space or whatever, doing that more than once is terrible. <laughs> Will be terrible and you're going to be paying for the labor if you're having someone else pull it for you. So paying for the labor once to run a bigger wire is uh, a good way to sort of future proof things. So another thing to consider as you're thinking about the future of your shop is are you going to have a second person working with you in your shop in the future? Because if you are, it's going to be more than one tool or more than one machine running at once. So that's going to be a little more power requirements. I think for most hobbyist type people, that's probably not a big possibility except for one little caveat, which would be if you're planning to add a CNC machine to your shop. A CNC is essentially like a second person working in your shop. So if you're going to have that in the future, you might want to plan for that now as you're thinking about your electrical requirements. Now the next thing on the list is going to be, are you going to run everything inside the walls or are you going to do a surface mount like I have here with the conduit? Uh, that's probably going to be more uh, dependent on the conditions of the space you're going into. So in my case here, I use conduit because the walls were already sheetrocked when I moved in. So the surface mount 
this makes more sense than trying to fish wire behind walls or taking down all that sheetrock and then doing it all over again. Now Conduit does have a built-in feature-proofing advantage in that is it is very easy to expand or change your setup. So if you wanted to add another receptacle on an existing circuit, it'd be very easy to just put a new piece of Conduit onto another box and put your new box in, put your new receptacle, pull your wires, and you have your new outlet wherever you need it to be. Now along with that, a little uh, feature-proofing, I guess, tip or idea to keep in the back of your mind is as you or your electrician is doing a fill calculation on your conduit size, just plan for some extra wires to be in there so that way in the future, if you do need to pull a new circuit through that conduit, you'll be able to do that without exceeding the actual capacity of that conduit. Now something else to think about is going to be wire size, and this is going to be more for the larger stationary tools, your 220 volt tools. It might be a good idea to pull a bigger wire size than you need right now in case you do plan to upgrade. Most, uh, I guess, tools that would be in a shop like this, kind of the biggest thing you're going to see is going to be a 5 horse motor in a tool and that you're going to be pulling usually a 10 gauge wire. So if you have a 3 horse motor right now, which usually most of those only need a 12 gauge wire, it might be a good idea to just pull a 10 gauge just in case you want to upgrade that tool to a bigger one in the future. That's not too big of a deal with conduit because you can always pull back, you know, your bigger wire through that conduit as long as it actually can fit in there within that fill calculation. But if you're doing a, you know, Romex inside of a wall and you can't really change that very easily, probably a good idea just to go a little bigger. That way you don't have to worry about it in the future. So in the future, when you get that bigger tool, all you have to do is change the receptacle and the breaker and you are done with that upgrade. So those are a few things to consider as you're thinking about how to set up your shop. Uh, next, let's talk a little bit about the specific layout of the stuff here in my shop. In my old shop, I had an open ceiling, which is really nice for, you know, feature proofing in that sense, because whenever I needed to add a receptacle or added a tool and it had a new power requirement, very easy to pull a new line through the ceiling and put it wherever you need to go. One thing I learned from that experience was I like my 220 outlets to be up in the ceiling. I don't unplug those like basically ever. So having them up and out of the way was a really nice way to go about it. It's kind of funny how that happened because it was just easier. I could just throw the box in the ceiling. I didn't have to have it drop down into the actual space. So I, I carried that forward here in this shop. So as we take a look around the shop, you can see I have the outlet for the jointer. That's the table saw. And on this side is the planer back there up top again. Dust collector has its power coming from there. And then I have an outlet up there, which was for the lathe whenever it gets parked back in here to use. Coming over on this side, the bridge port has an outlet up there. There is an additional circuit over here for future use. Uh, right now it's powering my, uh, my dust collector, which is over there. So it's uh, getting used kind of sooner than I thought. And then the only exception to this is over here where I have the welding outlet here in the corner. And then come back to the panel, you can see all of the 220 breakers in here that the double pole breakers. So most of the tools are on their own separate dedicated breakers. The only exception is going to be the jointer and planer, which are daisy chained or they're on the same circuit. Everything else is all by itself. And then along the bottom here throughout the shop are the 110 volt outlets and they are just pretty much spaced throughout the shop. Kind of put them, you know, wherever all over the place. I did just go with a single duplex versus, you know, putting two of those duplexes in there for four outlets. Uh, if I'm gonna need more than just that many and I'm gonna have stuff plugged in all the time, I like to use these things. That actually allows you to have the cords kind of off the side. So it's a little less protruding into the, uh, the space. So that's how I would get my four outlets out of just the two. Now, as we're walking around, I wanted to touch on one thing from uh, the shop setup video, which is lighting. So from that video, I had the 12 eight foot fixtures in this bay, as well as the last bay over there. The middle bay, I put these six foot fixtures in because the distance between these two beams is less than eight feet. Uh, I could have put the fixtures diagonally, but uh, I don't know. <laughs> Didn't really like that idea. And I already had this conduit in here that was perpendicular, so I just went with the six foot fixtures and there are 11 of those in this middle bay. Now all those lights are spread over three different circuits, so I'm pretty well good there. 
Uh, the only thing that I'm thinking about now is actually adding some more because there are some dark spots in the shop. The bench is not illuminated quite enough. It's a little bit on the dim side, so I'll probably end up adding uh, two to three more fixtures directly over the bench. And I plan to add some maybe to the underside of these beams just to light up this area in here. But uh, we're, we're, we're getting there. We're, we're getting close to having enough light. <laughs> And one other little bit of follow-up from the previous videos has to do with the garage door openers. So I removed the powered one from that bay. And I still have this one here. It is disconnected and I don't use it. And uh, I haven't taken it down because that's a fantastic place to store it. <laughs> so I'll probably get rid of it at some point, but right now it's out of the way enough where it's not a huge deal. But uh, yeah, I've never used it. So that's how my, uh, my shop is set up electrically. Uh, my last shop, I wired that one myself, and in this shop, I had an electrician come out and do it. This was back in January, so right after I had kind of got the shop set up and I was waiting to hook everything up, I had spent a lot of time kind of messing around with the drywall. That was my fun time, and I decided to hire out the work here so I could do other things. So when they were installing the electrical in here, I was off doing workbench kits, so it gave me some more time to do other stuff. Total cost on the install was $4,400, and they actually broke it out as far as materials versus uh, labor goes. Material cost was about $1,400, and then the remainder, about three grand, was um, labor. So that's two electricians for two days, and it's it's crazy how fast <laughs> it went. <laughs> they, they came on a Monday and a Tuesday. They, they came in, I think, at 8 a.m., and by 9 o'clock in the morning, an hour into it, they already had the sub-panel installed and the wire run to the main. So it was, it went really quick. The first day they had all the conduit and everything installed on this side of the shop, and all they had left to do was to kind of put in all the outlets and put up all the conduit on that side of the shop. So it actually progressed really quickly, and it did a really great job. If you are in this area, the Minneapolis area, uh, Signature Electric is who I had come out and do it. They were able to fit me in really quickly because they were actually pretty busy. And uh, they did a really clean job. <laughs> I was like, that, that's what I appreciated the most was the fact that there wasn't like stripped wire insulation everywhere. There weren't like knockouts all over the place. They cleaned up all the drywall dust and just the quality of like the bend and all the conduit. It looks really good. So I'm really happy with the job they did. So one thing I did to make it a little bit easier for them when they came to take a look at the job and then when they came to actually do the job was I went around the shop and I put a piece of masking tape where I wanted all of the receptacles to be. I indicated the voltage of that receptacle and if it was a 220 volt receptacle, I indicated the style of receptacle on there because if you haven't got into the uh, to 220 volt tools, there's a whole plethora of different styles of plugs and receptacles you can have. So obviously I wanted to make sure that the receptacle that they installed matches the plug that actually is supposed to go into that for that tool. That is the electrical. Let's talk a little bit about uh, heat. Yeah, heat. So I know this just looks like a floor, but uh, this is actually my heater. <laughs> so this garage was installed with an in-floor radiant heating system. So there are uh, plastic pipes or PEX tubing in the, in the concrete here and hot water is circulated through the pipes which heats the slab which then in turn becomes a giant radiator and radiates heat into the area into everything touching it and everything touching it becomes a radiator, radiator as well and it's just like a super even like super crazy nice way of heating a space after experiencing this for this past winter there is like zero comparison. It's, it's one of those things that you can't really retrofit, <laughs> but uh, I, I have no desire to go back to forced air after this. The, just like, it's so much more comfortable and so much more even of a working environment than forced air is. So over the winter, I was able to keep the temperature in here actually lower than I used to prefer in my old shop with forced air because it just felt so it, it, it felt so weird and, and warm. So in my old shop, I usually have the thermostat set about 75, 77, somewhere in there. And then I still feel kind of cold. <laughs> but in here over the winter, I had it set about 68 or 69 degrees all winter. And I felt the same amount of like warmth and comfort that I did at that higher temperature at the old shop. So 
I think just being the heat actually coming up from the floor into your body and like this isn't sucking all the heat out of you like you would in a normal shop or my last shop, the floor was sucking heat out of the area, whereas this is putting heat in and allowing it to come up into you. So much more comfortable working environment. But let's take a quick walk inside and I'll just show you the system that heats the garage. So this is the utility room and here's the, the panel. There's the wire that feeds the shop right there. And this is the in-floor heating system. So essentially all it is, this is a tankless hot water heater and there are two circulating circuits in here that get the hot water from here into all the things in the house. So this room we're in right now, everything above it, the shop and the great room above that are all addition to this house that was put on about 10 years ago and everything in this addition has the in-floor heating system in it. So this heats basically everything in this half of the house. So down here you can see the two uh, circuits. We have the primary circuit and this like secondary thing. I don't really know how all this stuff works, but essentially this pump just keeps the water flowing through the boiler and then the hot water is allowed to come over into the second circuit over here. And this is what actually goes out to the manifold which controls where all the water in the house is going to go based on the thermostats. So we got two circulation pumps in here. And then if we turn over here, this is where the manifolds are for the whole house. So throughout the house and in the shop, there's going to be a thermostat in every room and it's going to correspond to the different zones here. So this little taco box, you can see this one can control up to six zones. We only have five in this house, but if the thermostat calls for heat, this thing is going to uh, control all these valves on here and it'll actually allow water to flow through that circuit. So the garage is zone four, so if there is a call for heat from the thermostat in the garage, this valve will open, allowing water to flow down, stay here, into this uh, manifold here. And it's pretty cool because you can watch and see how much water is flowing through there. And of course right now nothing because it is uh, it's off because it's, it's May and it's hot. So my heating system does a really nice job. There's only one sort of issue that I have with it right now, and that is in the winter time, it can't quite keep up with the, uh, the extreme cold in like the deepest, darkest part of winter. Uh, for that, I have a supplemental heating source. So I bought a small space heater, which helps to bring up that temp a little bit and make it uh, room temp again. So it's not, not a huge deal because it's only like two or three weeks out of the year. So it's not too big of a deal. I don't yet have air conditioning in here. Air conditioning is something I was planning on adding or I wanted to add for the last few years. Uh, at the old shop though, I was like, well, we're gonna be moving. So what's the point of adding air conditioning if we're gonna be moving at some point? Uh, years and years and years went by and we still hadn't moved. Uh, but hopefully soon I'll be able to just get that in here. I'll probably do a mini split so that'll allow me to have a supplemental heating source in the winter here as well. So welcome back to the old shop. I thought real quick we can talk a little bit about the, uh, the heater in here and what it is, how it's all hooked up and the overall experience with it for whatever it was, like nine years I was in the shop. So these ceiling mounted garage heaters are pretty ubiquitous. You can get like, they're like everywhere. There's a whole bunch of different brands. This one is a 45,000 BTU. This is, I think it's a Mr. Heater brand unit and it is a natural gas. So in this shop, this is the garage, above here is living space. We have a gas line that comes through the house, runs through the garage, and goes up to the wall heater that heats the room above here. So it's very easy for me to tee off. Whoop. So it's very easy for me to tee off here and run a new gas line over here to power the heater, or fuel the heater. The electrical, it just needs a 110 volt connection there. And then there is a thermostat that is here on this wall right there. The only other thing for these things is going to be an exhaust. This is not a high efficiency unit, so it does combust the uh, interior air and shoot it outside. I made this uh, window insert thing, so the normal windows look like that. It's made a quick little frame and made a little hole here so I can run the actual exhaust out the window or out a hole in the side of the building so they can't really easily go up through the roof or up through the living space above and then up above there. So this thing does work really well for the space. It does bring up the air temp 
really quickly. This garage space is like partially like underground, so it does have a little bit of a thermal break. If I do not run the heater, the coldest it ever gets out here is about 32, 34 degrees. So right at or right above freezing, even when it's like negative 20 outside. So that's the coldest I've ever seen in here is right at freezing, which is, which is kind of nice. So when it's really cold outside and I come out here, the heater really only has to raise the air, air temp, what, 40 degrees or so to bring it to a more comfortable level. Uh, so it doesn't have to work super hard. When I first installed this heater, I'd only run it when I was out here. So that would be on evenings and weekends. And then a few years into it, once I started making videos and I was in and out of here throughout the day full time, I just left it running and kept the space at a holding temperature. The holding temperature I kept at was 66. And then again, I'd bring the thermostat up to about 77 and let it fill the space with nice warm air, bring up the temp of everything in the shop, and then I can go about my filming. The biggest downside to this for me, and I've talked about this in the past, is that it is loud. Well, it's loud for filming. It does muddy up my audio a lot, and people have suggested two things for that would be either to create a, uh, a noise sample and remove it in post, which fixing things in post, I prefer not to have to worry about it. And the other thing would be to just lay the noise over the entire track, which I also don't like. <laughs> so when I was out here, I have a temp up to 77, I turn it off. And if I had to record anything where you're gonna hear the actual audio, so that'd be any time that my dust collector was not running, I would have the heater off. So it got cold. <laughs> <laughs> the temp definitely dropped quite a bit. The, uh, the air sealing in here is not super great, so air does find its way back in here, the cold air. But overall, pretty good. One question that I'm sure people are wondering is like the cost to operate these things. I'll tell you this much, I have no idea because I have never gone through a winter without a heater actually running. The only little bit of data I can provide is going from part-time running of this to full-time running and having the space heated continuously through the winter, that raised the gas bill about $30 a month. So that was my, my only bit of data. Otherwise, I've never gone through a winter where I have not run that, so I have no base idea of cost. <laughs> and then there's, the, there's a sub-panel there. <laughs> After having spent the winter here and doing filming and stuff, it's quite a lot nicer experience for me to be a little more streamlined because I don't have to wait for the heater to turn off as I'm trying to film something. I can just keep working and it's so much more of a streamlined process for me. So I absolutely love the in-floor heat. One thing I'll also touch on too is dehumidification. Uh, I started running a dehumidifier in my old shop a few years ago and that really helped in the summertime to make it less swampy. <laughs> uh, it's, it's crazy how much more comfortable just being in like a more drier environment is. So it does help to knock off the extreme heat uh, edge, I guess of it. And as far as building projects out of wood, it's a lot nicer for your material to be at a equilibrium moisture content, which is much closer to what it would be in a conditioned indoor space. So I don't have to plan for as much insane shrinkage as my wood goes from super wet from being outside in my shop to be super dry sitting in the house. So that's gonna do it for this one. Hopefully that answers some of your questions and give you some things to think about as you're pondering the infrastructure, the unseen infrastructure of your, your shop. The things need to be there for everything else to happen, but otherwise, if it's done right, you shouldn't think about them, I guess. <laughs> so next time we're going to continue on with the Shop Move series. We're going to be uh, moving and hanging this ridiculous thing right here, the Hantle Cabin, which uh, there's, there's a lot of stuff in there. <laughs> So thank you as always for watching. I greatly appreciate it. If you have any questions or comments about the new shop or the old shop, please feel free to leave me a comment. As always, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. And until next time, happy woodworking. Wood!